This is a Yahoo Finance special, the Biden presidency, six months in the White House. The new administration is claiming victory on a number of fronts, a $2 trillion spending bill, a resurgent economy, lower unemployment, and the expansion of government programs like Obamacare and food stamps. These kinds of public investments mean more jobs, more workers participating in the labor force, higher productivity, and higher growth for our economy over the long run. But that long run contains many hurdles for Biden's domestic and foreign policy agendas. A new strain of COVID, the crisis on our southern border, rising tensions with China and Russia. There are also deep divides among the president's own party and the opposition on Capitol Hill. The heart of democracy requires consensus. Despite the president's talk about unity, consensus appears dead. The question now, is the president's expansive agenda also dead? Join us for this Yahoo Finance special, The Biden Presidency, six months in the White House. Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live, special presentation of The Biden Presidency, six months in the White House. I'm Adam Shapiro. And I'm Shauna Smith. Today marks President Biden's sixth month in the White House. And over the next hour, we will take you through the president's accomplishments, his failures, and plans for the next three and a half years. Plus, we'll, we will be speaking with White House National Economic Council Director Brian Deese later this hour. But let's kick things off with Yahoo Finance's Jessica Smith, who is live in Washington, as we take a look back at the, pres at the Biden presidency so far. Jess? Yeah, Adam and Shauna, the first six months of President Biden's time in office have largely been defined by the fight against COVID and getting the economy back on track. On the campaign trail, he promised to work across party lines and bring the country together. And now he's looking for his first major bipartisan victory, but there's still a long way to go. I, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., do solemnly swear. When President Biden took office in January, his first priority was getting COVID-19 under control. He pushed his roughly $2 trillion American Rescue Plan through Congress with only Democratic votes, putting more money toward the fight against COVID while sending additional relief to parents, unemployed workers, state and local governments, schools and small businesses. Six months later, more than 160 million Americans are fully vaccinated, the stock market has reached new all-time highs, and the unemployment rate has dropped to 5.9 percent, down from 6.3 percent in January. Our economy is on the move, and we have COVID-19 on the run. But the Delta variant is raising new concerns as the pace of vaccination slows. Prices have gone up for businesses and consumers, and Republicans are blaming Biden while sounding the alarm about rising inflation. Families are feeling it everywhere, from the supermarket to the gas pump to the housing to the used car lot and beyond. All thanks in part to the Democrats' half-baked spending spree from this springtime. Biden is now focused on his long-term economic recovery proposals, the American Jobs and American Families plans. He managed to strike a deal with centrist senators on nearly $600 billion in new spending on traditional infrastructure and broadband. None of us got what we all that we wanted. Bipartisan deals mean to compromise. But it's still not clear if the agreement can pass both chambers of Congress to give President Biden a bipartisan win. Meanwhile, Democrats are working on the rest of the president's economic agenda that didn't survive bipartisan talks. The White House and Democratic leaders are trying to pass a $3.5 trillion plan that includes ways to fight climate change, paid leave, and an expansion of Medicare, likely paid for by raising taxes on businesses and wealthy Americans. The people at the top who escape paying all or a lot of taxes? No, 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 they're gonna pay their fair share for the first time in a long time. In his first six months, Biden tried to reset alliances around the globe. He organized a climate summit with world leaders and welcomed his foreign counterparts to the White House. He took his first international trip to reconnect with allies in Europe and confront Russian President Vladimir Putin amid a surge in cyber attacks. Responsible countries need to take action against criminals who conduct ransomware activities on their territory. 
The administration built support among the world's leading economies for a global minimum tax, but it could be a hard sell back home in D.C. And with just slim majorities in Congress, Biden continues to face challenges beyond just his economic agenda. Lawmakers will keep debating voting rights, police reform and immigration in the months ahead. The next few days are going to be critical for this bipartisan infrastructure plan. We are expecting a key procedural vote tomorrow. The Republicans are still pushing to delay it. Adam and Shauna. He has joined us several times in the past, and it's good to have you here again, Representative. Good to see you, Adam. Thank you. I want to start on this issue of infrastructure. I realize this is going on in the Senate with the bipartisan effort to try and get a bill. But the issue that seems to be holding things up is paying for it. And one thing that Democrats have proposed is perhaps raising taxes to do that. So if you could be part of that negotiation, how would you steer it? Yeah, so I would separate uh, infrastructure from this massive $3.5 trillion social spending plan. I think that is the real roadblock to infrastructure. I'm, I'm pretty confident we can find common ground both on infrastructure and how to pay for it. But obviously, Speaker Pelosi continues to link the two. As long as that's the case, I think there's going to be problems. Congressman, it's Shauna here. It's great to see you again. The economy is, is expanding. It's expanding rapidly. I know you might argue with a few uh, areas of it or where it could improve at least. But I guess if we do see higher taxes, I guess how much of a threat is that to the expansion that we're seeing in the economy today? Yeah, I think it's pretty significant. But I would say this, look, there are some pretty troubling signs. 2021 ought to be a blowout year. You've got trillions of COVID st stimulus, reopening communities. You've got uh, life-saving vaccines. But right now, uh, job growth is slowing, about 1.4 million fewer jobs in the first half of this year than the last half of 2020. Secondly, economic growth is slowing down. New CBO projections show about 30 percent slower economic growth after we get through this sugar high. Economic optimism uh, is down. Real wages are down and have been every month this year. The only thing seemingly going up are rising prices. And so you're seeing this inflation driven by massive government spending and the president paying people more to stay home than to work. And so for that reason, uh, at this six month point on this economic report card, we would give him a inflation adjusted F. Representative, I realize that less than 60 percent of Americans have some kind of tie to the stock market. The previous president would cheer when the stock market hit highs. And here's what the current president, President Biden, had to say about the stock market. The stock market is higher than it has been in all of history, even when it's down this month, even down this month. Now, I don't look at the stock market as a means by which to judge the economy like my, my uh, predecessor did. But he'd be very, he'd be talking to you every day for the last five months about how the stock market is so high, higher than any time in history. How do you respond to what President Biden is now saying about the stock market and its relation to the economy? You know, I think he seems to have flip flopped. And in some days, he's uh, sort of claiming credit for the stock market uh, surges and others not. I think the importance of the stock market really is. For families whose retirement is tied up in the success of these companies, it is very much a, a big deal. I think the, the bigger measurement back home for families is, you know, what can I buy with my family budget? And right now, they're, you know, if, if the inflation keeps going, they will have about a 4% real cut in their paychecks by the end of this year. We know Main Street businesses are struggling to find workers. It's dragging the economy down as well. But to the earlier question, I think these tax increases that ultimately land on small businesses, uh, families, uh, local investors, I think overall uh, will drive U.S. jobs overseas uh, in a significant way. I think that and the attack on American-made energy, uh, all are, frankly, unforced economic errors that are slowing this economy down in a significant way. 
Congressman, you mentioned inflation, and I want to dig a little bit deeper into that because we did just get that pretty uh, big jump, 5.4 percent jump last week in terms of inflation. Now, the president, we've heard Fed Chair Jay Powell say that they continue to think that this pressure will be transitory and that the higher inflation isn't here to stay. It sounds like you might be a little bit more worried about this. How big of a concern is this for you going forward? You know, it is a big concern, and, and not just for me. You know, we just saw new surveys here in the last 48 hours that show about 9 out of 10 Americans are very worried about rising prices, the impact on their purchasing power. Uh, they see this massive government spending as, uh, as part of that problem. And in the same survey, about 7 out of 10 Americans are worried about what these impending tax increases will mean for local businesses and the economy as a whole. So, you know, I know the White House first denied there would be significant inflation. Now they're saying it's transitory. But my worry is consumer sentiment and expectations continue to lengthen, and not just them, but the business community as well. And so we don't want inflation, and we want a very strong recovery. But I think the policies of the president are driving some of these troubling issues. When you talk about inflation, I mean, some of us, I measure it through the price of a can of black beans. It used to be a buck 29, it's now a buck 59, and I realize that may sound funny in some ways, but to people on fixed incomes, that, that 30 cent increase is a lot if you're putting food on the table. So when you hear the Democrats proposing this 3.5 trillion in reconciliation, what would the impact be if that were to go through, do you think, on prices? You know, it, one significant would be the short answer, Adam. Secondly, look, uh, the time for emergency spending is over. Uh, the time for never-ending government checks, as the president proposes, is over. It really is time to get back to a normal fiscal house uh, where we focus on the investments on infrastructure, on productivity, on education, rather than really what I think is a pretty misguided, dramatic expansion of government at this point. I think. If Americans see another three and a half trillion dollars of spending go out the door, you know, there's no question it's going to reinforce their belief that inflation will be much longer than the White House hopes it'll be. Congressman Kevin Brady, thanks so much for taking the time. Always great to speak with you. Coming up next, $4 trillion dollars in new you. government spending is being debated in Washington right now. Now, we will speak with House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee Chairman Peter DeFazio straight ahead about how negotiations are progressing. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. Now, $4 trillion in new government spending is being debated in Washington right now. Let's go back to Capitol Hill, where our own Jessica Smith is standing by. Jess. Yeah, Shauna, I am here with Congressman Peter DeFazio. He is the chair of the House Infrastructure, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for the opportunity. Let's start talking about infrastructure. The House has already passed your plan, the Invest in America Act, that um, water and transportation infrastructure bill. You've been clear you're not a fan of this bipartisan deal. So do you think Senate Democrats tomorrow should vote for it, vote to move ahead in this debate? Well, we're expressing our concerns. We passed a transformative transportation bill that met the goals set by the White House, that is to deal significantly with climate change, create new programs for social equity, for transit deserts, underserved communities, rejoining communities split asunder by freeways, uh, major titles uh, on safety, uh, and uh, you know, significant uh, increase in investment in transit, significant increase in rail, and uh, most of those things are lacking in the Senate proposal. In fact, they have no transit at this point in time. Uh, their rail title is way smaller uh, than ours. It's not going to move us toward high and higher speed rail. Uh, and then the policies they have uh, do not deal meaningfully uh, with climate change, fossil fuel pollution. Uh, their social equity programs are one sixth of ours. They don't have. They lack the policies. So. Uh, we're very concerned about the lack of involvement and discussion with us and between us and the Senate. So Politico quoted you saying the whole thing falling apart is probably the best thing. So to be clear, do you want this bipartisan plan to fail at this point? One of two things. Um, they can pass it as a standalone bill and we go to conference uh, and make it better and work out our differences, mm -hmm. or it fails. If this is a take it or leave it on the House side, I'm going to leave it. So what specifically do you want to see? What changes do you want to see in order to make this passable in the House? We're, look, we've been living off the Eisenhower era for you know, 70 years. It's the 21st century. Uh, we have built 30,000 lane miles of highways in our 100 largest cities in the last 25 years. Guess what? They're more congested than ever. It's called induced demand. You build it, there's more traffic. Uh, we have to look at transit alternatives, commuter rail alternatives. Uh, we've got to make it safe for people to cycle and use uh, you know, pedestrians and cycling. There's a 50% increase in fatalities in the last 10 years in cycling and pedestrians because it's not safe. My bill deals with all those things. Their bill doesn't. I, those things have to be in a 21st century bill. I'm not going to do Eisenhower 8.0 and repeat the mistakes of the last century. Let's talk about climate a bit, because that is a key priority for you, for many Democrats in, in the House and the Senate. What provisions do you want to see on climate specifically? We have something called Fix It First. Uh, there are states, Texas and states like that, it's like their solution is more big highways, rip down, go through more neighborhoods, you know, just make it wider and bigger. Uh, Virginia just rejected that approach and they figured out a, a different approach with commuter rail. I want states before they engage in massive expansion of highways to look at alternatives that might better serve the people in that state, that city, or that region, uh, which won't be fossil fuel polluting single occupancy vehicles jamming up the road. You know, we've heard from Republicans and even some moderate Democrats like Senator Joe Manchin saying that they're concerned about some of the climate measures that are in the reconciliation plan. So how do you balance the concerns of progressives who say climate has to be in this bill and moderates who are concerned about it? Well, in reconciliation, uh, they're dealing with uh, fossil fuel pollution from transportation is the biggest polluter in the country. Second largest is energy. And in reconciliation, they're going to deal with renewable power and grid reinforcement so we can wheel that so people aren't charging their electric vehicles uh, off of a coal plant. You don't get much of a gain there. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a different title in their bill, and that's absolutely necessary to move toward more renewable energy uh, to, you know, to charge the vehicles that are coming. And we're going electric. The world's going electric. GM's going all electric. Federal Express is going all electric, run by a very conservative Republican, including semis. Uh, there are already four companies producing electric semis. Uh, there's no place to charge them. Uh, we have to build the backbone, and then we have to supply the power to charge those vehicles. You know, a big sticking point in all of this has been how do you pay for it? And it sounds like, at least on the Senate side, the IRS enforcement, the ramped up enforcement, is, have been dropped from the bill. I know you have a bill to narrow the tax gap. 
What do you think about them dropping this measure and how do you want to move forward and make sure people pay what they owe? Well, they're ripping off average Americans. They say an average family is paying 3,000 bucks more a year in taxes because of tax avoidance by millionaires and billionaires. It's estimated, there's credible estimates that say it's $600 billion a year in avoidance. IRS's uh, staffing is 20% what it was below you know, 10 years ago. Uh, they've had a massive turnover because the people aren't well paid, they're being abused. Uh, we need you know, professionals there. We need to close these tax loopholes. We need to make those people pay under existing law what they're supposed to pay. And apparently the Republicans don't think it's fair to make them pay what they actually owe. That's, that's, uh, you know, that's nasty. You know, we have heard a lot, we just heard it from Congressman Kevin Brady, concerns about inflation, especially as you consider trillions of dollars in new spending. What do you say to, to those concerns? Well, I just read today that 40% of the increase last month was used car prices, which by the way have plateaued and starting to go down. Uh, and then before that, a big factor was lumber prices and housing. Lumber's down 60% in the last two months. Uh, what we saw was huge bottlenecks coming out of COVID after the pandemic, and there's still bottlenecks out there. We're working our way through those things. I don't believe this is going to be a sustained threat. The Federal Reserve doesn't believe it's a sustained threat. Treasury doesn't believe it's a sustained threat. Only the Republicans do. They've been carrying on about inflation forever, but it hasn't happened. Okay, I think we have to leave it there. Thank you so much, Congressman Peter DeFazio, Chair of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. We'll send it back to you in New York. Jessica, thank you. And coming up, the Biden administration's plan to offer relief for American families. We talked to Valerie Jarrett, the former senior advisor to President Obama. That's next. And welcome back to Yahoo Finance's special presentation, The Biden Presidency, Six Months in the White House. Joining us right now is Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. And, and Rick, you pay attention to the victories and perhaps defeats of all the administrations, but what's the biggest risk do you think right now to President Biden's economic agenda? Inflation is probably up there, Adam. Uh, obviously, this is getting a lot of, of attention these days. We've now got headline inflation of over 5%. I don't think this is going to be, uh, it, I think it's going to be a different kind of problem come next year when we're looking into the 2022 midterms. So a lot of the inflation we're seeing right now is driven by things where demand and prices really plummeted during the pandemic. And it's these weird categories like used cars uh, up a ton, uh, new car inflation is up by a lot less than that. And then 
things related to travel because prices were so low a year ago. That's going to sort itself out. But I think there are three things um, Biden needs to be concerned about. And he keeps saying, don't worry, inflation is temporary. I'm not so sure about that. Number one, pay attention to rents. They have been going up lately. Uh, and rents, once they go up, do not really come down. Other stuff goes up and uh, people buy less of it. And that brings the price down, keeps it aligned. Not so much with rents. And of course, that's a big part of the family budget for a lot of people. Watch food. Uh, it looks like a lot of the price increases that happened during the beginning days of the pandemic have actually stuck. And of course, energy and gasoline are very important. Uh, we've got gas well over three bucks a gallon right now. That could moderate, but boy, voters really care about gas prices. So that will be important by next year as well. They certainly do. And as Rick, as uh, more and more people just face higher prices on a day to day basis, one thing that millions of Americans are feeling, I guess, a little bit of assistance with is the child tax credit started to hit bank accounts for millions of Americans over the past week. And of course, this is aimed at reducing child poverty, also helping with child care expenses. But I'm curious to get your perspective on this. The Biden administration touting this as a huge win. Is there a downside, do you think, to the child tax credit? Well, it certainly fuels the Republican claims that Biden is experimenting with socialism or forcing socialism on Americans. I, I don't endorse that view. But I think it's going to be a real interesting test of whether this type of thing works politically. And it does reflect the type of larger or, or more government involvement that Biden favors. Uh, Republicans and conservatives say this is this is too much of a handout. But uh, look, this is going to this is actually going to help millions of voters, and it's temporary. Uh, Biden's pitch to voters is keep Democrats in office, and we will make this permanent. And of course, Republicans are likely to say we can't do this much longer; we can't afford it. So this will be a real interesting test case for 2022. All right, Rick Newman, thanks so much. Well, the Biden administration, like Rick was saying, touting this child tax credit as one of its key victories so far during the past six months. Well, earlier today, I had a chance to speak with Valerie Jarrett, the former senior advisor to President Barack Obama, about Biden's first six months in office and some of his other key victories that he has scored during that time. Let's take a listen to what she had to say. What a difference six months make is how I begin. Incredible difference for our country. Uh, what President Biden said is that he was going to focus on uh, tackling the ability to get the vaccine into arms so that we can make sure that can, we can contain this pandemic. And he was also going to rebuild our economy. And he has followed through on both of those commitments. We have seen uh, record growth in our economy, stronger than the last four decades. And we have seen countless Americans receive the vaccine. But we know our work is not done. And as he will say later today, we have to ensure that we get um, our economy rebuilding. We want to be globally competitive, which means investing in everything from early childhood education to making college more affordable to investing in advanced manufacturing and ensuring that we have um, the availability for every American to have affordable health care. So he has a lot left to do, but his first six months have been very strong. And Valerie, speaking of some of those initiatives that he has uh, already laid out, the child tax credit that started hitting bank accounts for millions of Americans over the last several days, I know that you have spoken out in support of this. I guess, why do you think this is such a smart use of federal funds and why this is so important here in terms of helping the economy recover from the pandemic? It's helping hardworking families. And we know that there are countless families around our country that are still struggling, struggling, notwithstanding the fact that we've seen the economy growing and making sure that we have resources available to bring our children out of poverty, to ensure that we have affordable childcare. So many working families, particularly working moms, have been stuck in this horrible limbo of not being able to afford childcare for their children so that they can go back and work. And so I think what President Biden is doing is redefining infrastructure, not just roads and bridges, kind of the infrastructure of the last century, but infrastructure to support working families so that they are able to go back to work and able to get the skills that they need to compete for the jobs of the future. Well, Valerie, one of the uh, big topics over the next couple of days is going to be the bipartisan infrastructure talks, the bill that was, or the deal that was, uh, I guess, reached among some Senate Democrats, uh, Senator Chuck Schumer's pushing this forward this week. I guess how, when you take a look at this, there's some concern now that it could potentially fall apart. It's been, there's been some resistance here from some Senate Democrats. When you take a look at this, if we don't see the bipartisan bill, how worrisome is that for you? Or do you think that three and a half trillion, rec a trillion dollar reconciliation bill would be enough? 
Well, first best, is, of course, is to see a bipartisan group of leaders come together and put Americans first, to put their political issues aside and focus on what is best for our country. And so I think the bill should move forward. I'm encouraged to see that, they, that members are still talking on both sides of the aisle, that they recognize the importance, that they recognize that the American Family Rescue Act was not enough. The Rescue Act did not do the job. It, it helped many businesses, and it certainly helped us position ourselves um, to get vaccines into arms, but it wasn't enough to rebuild our economy the way we need to do uh, for the future. And so I'm hoping they'll put their short-term political interests aside and focus on what's best for our country. I don't have the tea leaves. The fact that they're still talking, they worked late into the night last night, um, I think is encouraging. I think, I think the fact that Leader Schumer said, look, we need to call the question and, and, and have a vote for cloture, kind of put an emergency on this. And I'm hopeful that cool heads will prevail and they'll, they'll be able to move forward. One of the big uh, reasons why some Republican lawmakers are pushing back on this or saying that it's going to uh, cause inflation to spike even more, a bigger jump than what we've seen. They blamed uh, Biden's $1.9 trillion stimulus package as to some of the reason why we're seeing the inflation that we're seeing today. I guess, how worried are you about inflation or the fact that a $3.5 trillion bill or another large package from the Biden administration could attribute to further inflation down the line? I am not worried about it, uh, I'm basing that on what the experts are saying. I think what we have to focus right now is what are we going to do to help our economy strengthen and continue the growth that we've seen over the last six months. And what experts will tell you is that the efforts so far are not going to carry us forward for the long term. And they're certainly not going to position us for the kind of growth that we'd like to see the United States have into the future. And so I think it's an important investment to make all across our country, businesses and people are still suffering. They're struggling. And although we are certainly seeing more growth than we've seen in the last four decades, we don't want to see that stop now. And so this is an opportunity for us to invest, for example, in infrastructure that has been deferred for decades. Um, not only our roads and bridges are crumbling, but we know that there are benefits that Americans need in order to continue to grow our economy. And so I think that the fears about inflation are not well placed and that we should focus on what we need right now that positions us into the future. Valerie, you mentioned uh, vaccinations a few moments ago and, and how big of a stride we have made just in terms of the number of Americans vaccinated. I was going through the numbers this morning. According to the CDC, 59% of the U.S. population 18 years and older have been fully vaccinated. So yes, that's a massive accomplishment, but that still means 40% of the U.S. adult population still is not fully vaccinated. What needs to be done? What can the Biden administration do in order to get that number higher over the next several months when the next several months are so critical because of the Delta variant? It's such a good question. And you know, what we have to do is reach people where they are with trusted influencers. One of the organizations I chair the board of is Civic Nation, and it has an initiative called Made to Save, where we are using those people who are influential in their local communities where we are seeing vaccine hesitancy to try to convince them to do so. And we're doing this in partnership with the Biden administration. I think President Biden recognizes that he can't be the only one to carry this message. It has to be carried all across the country. We have to go into those communities that, that are being most hesitant and help convince them the only way that we're going to tackle this virus is that we have more and more Americans getting vaccinated. And the variant adds a whole new dimension. I was just looking at the news this morning and we're seeing like 99% of the people who are being hospitalized are people who have not had the vaccine. But we are worried that as we see these populations continue to, to uh, circulate with one another, even those who have the vaccine are being put at risk. A special thanks to Valerie Jarrett, former senior advisor to President Obama. Make sure to catch the rest of our interview tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern time right here on Yahoo Finance. Well, coming up, a conversation with Joe Biden's top economic advisor on the, on the record that President Biden has posted over the past six months. We'll also get his thoughts on where the economy is headed over the next six months. That comes up right after the break.
Welcome back to this Yahoo Finance special. And we want to bring into the stream our editor-in-chief, Andy Serwer, because the economy is in focus, especially as we move into the second half of the year. And Andy spoke with the director of the National Economic Council. Andy? Yeah, that's right, Adam. I did speak to NEC Director Brian Deese, who is the president's chief economic advisor, about the progress the administration has made over the past six months. Here's what he had to say. Well, if you take a step back six months in, it's just striking how much progress we've made. Three million jobs created. That's double the pace of the period prior to that. The rate of growth in 2021 dealt uh, as a result of the actions that we have taken. And you're seeing across America optimism about the future of the country and the future of the economy hitting uh, record highs. But at the same time, we can't stay, com we can't get complacent. Uh, we've always known and the president has always focused on the fact that uh, our, the pandemic and the economy are in inextricably intertwined. It's why we focus so uh, much on getting a vaccination program stood up and oriented. We've seen record uh, historic success on that front, but it's also why we need to stay uh, vigilant now. And so you heard the president, uh, as part of looking back over six months, reinforce just how important it is for those who have yet to be vaccinated to get vaccinated uh, and for us to continue this focus around the country and every community of the country. So you're going to continue to see the president do that. But uh, let's make no mistake, we've made extraordinary progress and we've got real durable momentum in the economy now. Another interesting thing the president recently said is that he doesn't look to the stock market for indications of the state of the economy, which is in a pretty clear contrast with the previous administration. How do you take into account, though, the ups and downs of the market, like today's drop and overall growth as you plan policies? Well, President Biden has always had a distinct view of uh, the economy, which is that we all do better as a country if growth comes from the bottom up and the middle out. And what that means is if you look at working people across the country, if they do better, they have more job opportunities, their wages are increasing, it's gonna mean the entire economy does better, including people at the top. So when that's your focus, what you're focused on is, are there jobs for the people uh, who want them? Are those jobs paying uh, more? And is there more innovation, more economic opportunity across the country? We'll see the market go uh, up and go down. I would note that over the course of this period, uh, we've seen the, the stock market hit uh, record highs, even with some of the uh, fluctuations, recent fluctuations, including uh, today. But the core objective of the, of the Biden economy is to have that kind of strong, durable growth that gives middle class families more ability to breathe, more economic opportunity. And we're starting to see that. We're starting to see a change in paradigm, certainly from the last administration. But this recovery is starting to show some signs of what it looks like when we have an economy where that growth is coming and is broadly shared. Just a couple of questions about the overall economic situation. Um, what have conversations about inflation been like in recent days in the building behind you? You highlighted the role of things like cars and driving some of the recent spikes. What gives you confidence that it will just be transitory? If you look at the composition of price increases over the last three months, what you see is a small share of the components that go into measuring uh, the price indexes are driving a very large share of the increases. So you mentioned cars. It's not just that we have a uh, global problem with supply of semiconductors, but we also we saw things like rental car companies in the U.S. sold off their fleets last year and are now are trying to catch up with the demand we're seeing in the economy, so there's increased pressure. We expect those things to work themselves out. Uh, they're not permanent changes into the structure of our economy. Same with airline prices, hotel prices. We're seeing them come back as demand comes back, but in many cases, not even to the levels of the pre-pandemic economy. So those are the categories that you would expect you were gonna see some, uh, some significant movement uh, as the economy uh, comes back. So this is something that along with uh, almost every economic variable, we pay a lot of close attention to. Uh, we study and we look forward to, and we recognize that when, you, when consumers see price increases, uh, they notice, but uh, we think that the, the data certainly indicates that um, mo much of what's going on here is these temporary factors that we anticipate will, uh, will, will not persist. And what about labor shortages, Brian? Um, you know, people are seeing these all over the place. Uh, employers are. Is there anything the administration can do about it, or is it just a matter of companies paying workers more? 
Well, we have, a, we're, we have to remember that we are recovering from a historic pandemic. And so there are a number of issues that people who uh, want to re-enter uh, the workforce have to grapple with. The first is the pandemic and the disease. They want to make sure that they feel safe. And as we move forward in vaccinating more of the country, we're seeing more people uh, have that comfort. The second is childcare and school, for, particularly for parents of school-aged kids. Do they have the support system in place so that they can go and they can participate fully in the workforce? Getting schools open, that's why this has been such a focus of the administration and the president, is providing the resources to actually get schools open safely, get child care centers open safely. Uh, and we have also seen that uh, we are in a market where there are um, where there are a lot of job openings. That's a good uh, thing for workers. They have more options. And one of the things that employers can do in that context is uh, pay uh, pay a, a fair wage, provide benefits. And we've seen anecdotally a lot of employers who have said, you know what, when I've raised my uh, wages, I've seen a lot of people uh, come and raise their hand for that work. So, you know, this is a combination of things. We have to recognize that we are coming out of a truly unique uh, pandemic. And at the same time, if worker, if uh, if businesses pay a fair wage, if they offer uh, benefits, we're confident that they're going to find uh, workers when they need them. Last question, Brian. You have a unique perspective here in that you served in the Obama administration. How do the challenges of the last six months in the Biden administration compare to early on in Obama's presidency when the U.S. also faced big economic challenges? Well, every economic crisis is unique. Uh, and early in the Obama administration, we were dealing with a financial crisis that hit at the core of individuals' balance sheets because of the uh, core housing crisis and the decline in prices. So as a result, the challenge is there of trying to reinstill uh, uh, trust and reinstill the, the confidence at the individual ba uh, household balance sheet level was really paramount. Here, we have a pandemic crisis. Uh, the kinds of things we just discussed about people's hesitance to return to the workforce in safe working conditions, those are unique. Uh, and as a result, that's why you've seen the president prioritize a all-out national vaccination effort and to surge support to families and businesses, to schools, to child care centers, to reflect the unique uh, realities of this crisis. But the good news six months in is that we are in a very different place economically. Uh, we're growing jobs at a historic pace. Our economy is growing at a historic pace. Unemployment claims are falling at a historic pace. So we've got a lot of momentum, and we just need to seize that, continue that, continue these policies, and finish the job of, as President Biden says, building back better, putting that economic strategy in place for the long term. That's NEC Director Brian Deese. And I spoke to him yesterday. So when he was referring to the market drop, of course, that was yesterday's big decline. Another point to make about him, Adam, is that if he doesn't look like a typical gray beard economist, it's because he isn't. Brian Deese is only 43 years old. And as you heard, of course, he worked for Barack Obama. He also worked at BlackRock. So uh, President Biden actually made note of the fact that Brian is a little young, but said he has uh, a great uh, a great brain and, and uh, look forward to working with him. I believe Yale Law is one of his alma maters, so um, no underachiever there. Andy, um, Rick Newman, our colleague, has looked at uh, some of the issues facing the, the Biden economic agenda, and he puts it in the context of, for instance, with inflation, that rents go up, they rarely come down. Does the administration look at those kinds of specifics? Did Dees give any indication if they measure those things the same way? Oh, I'm sure they're watching that like a hawk. I mean, this, of course, is the big question of our time right now. Is inflation transitory or not? And, you know, you heard him talking about that. And, of course, he's going to say that it is transitory. Most people seem to think it is. And I think it's just a question of degree. You know, is it transitory for three months, six months, or is it a three-year period? In which case, it becomes really a political animal, as Rick was talking about, because that will impact, as you say, Adam, uh, rents and then gas, uh, and then thereby the midterm election and maybe the next presidential election as well. And, and another thing that could potentially affect uh, Democrats and Republicans also in the next election would be the jobs market, because yes, certainly we have seen a number of workers re-enter the workforce, but we're still off just around 7 million jobs from where we were at the start of the pandemic. And I know you asked, Brian, just about 
where we stand just in terms of job creation, but any sense there just in terms of how this could potentially be a headwind for the Biden administration going forward? Yes, yeah, Shauna, I mean, this is really a vexing situation right now in America that there are so many open jobs, uh, people are not going back to work. Obviously, this does have something to do with the unemployment benefits, which are, of course, running out. Um, so we'll see what happens. But I do think, you know, as Brian Deese was suggesting, that employers are going to have to pony up. And that's going to have implications in the economy when you're looking at restaurants and hotels and services. That means those costs are going to get passed on to consumers, which will have an effect as well. So I think there's a lot to watch going forward. It's going to be a fascinating time. And you better believe that Brian Deese and company have their hands full looking uh, at what's going on and trying to influence this um, through uh, fiscal and monetary policy along with the Federal Reserve. Andy Serwer is our editor-in-chief. Good to see you. His full conversation with Brian Deese is available right now at yahoofinance.com. Coming up, two other big things on President Biden's plate, immigration and cyber attacks from China as well as Russia. We'll be right back with that. Republicans are beating the drum as they speak out against President Biden's border and immigration policy. Joining us now is Yahoo Finance's Kristen Myers with more on what's going on with the crisis at the border. Kristen? Hi, Adam. Hi, Shauna. Yeah, so right now, the Biden administration, and to a much larger extent, really Democrats at large are under a lot of pressure right now to do something about immigration and about that southern border. So I just want to run through some numbers really quickly about where we stand right now. So currently, the number of immigrants making those border crossings has been jumping, Adam. Now, the number of families making that southern border crossing jumped by 25% from the figures back in May. And according to, listen to this, the CBP, that's the Customs and Border Agents, they've made more than 1 million arrests so far in this fiscal year. And that is more than any one year total in over 15 years. 
Now, we've heard from officials from the Biden administration, including Vice President Kamala Harris, and even more recently from the Department of Homeland Secretary uh, Alejandro Mayorkas. They've been making these repeated statements, essentially trying to stem the flow of some of these undocumented immigrants at the border. But as the data is just clearly showing, these statements have absolutely not been working. And right now, Republicans have just been seizing on, on, on the Biden administration and really criticizing and slamming them for, frankly, being too soft on immigration uh, and for their efforts that aren't working. And lately, they've been pushing and slamming the Democrats for wanting to make this amnesty push and, and make this push for immigration as a part of that more than $3 trillion infrastructure deal. I want to quote Senator Lindsey Graham here. He called it the, quote, dumbest idea in the idea of the Senate and in the history of the White House. Now, this is all coming at a time when a federal judge just at the end of last week essentially announced that DACA, that program that was passed under President Obama, that that program was illegal. So it has created now this showdown uh, potentially in the Supreme Court. Now, again, increasing that pressure and really putting the pressure on Democrats and also on the administration to create some sort of legislative policy uh, before that happens. Now, for the part of the Biden administration, they said that they are going to appeal that ruling from that federal judge. Uh, but it is going to be interesting to see going forward what the White House does decide to do again on the immigration, because the number of arrests, guys, the numbers of those border crossings are absolutely increasing with every uh, successive month. Certainly a story we will continue to watch. Kristen, thanks so much. Turning to White House foreign policy. Now, critics say that President Biden is not doing enough to combat the cyber attacks by aggressors like Russia and China. So joining us now to discuss a little bit more about this, we want to bring in Yahoo News Editor-in-Chief Dan Kleidman. And Dan, Biden's policy towards China specifically really coming into focus, especially this week on the heels of the cyber attack on Microsoft. But I'm curious just to get your take on his approach to foreign policy so far and what he's done in order to counter some of these cyber attacks from China and from Russia? Well, um, the, the cyber and ransomware challenge um, is huge uh, for this administration. It's been a problem for a long time. We're seeing it's getting worse and worse. Uh, it could have a tremendous impact uh, on our economy and uh, national security more generally. Um, and I think that the Biden administration uh, has realized that it's going to have to get bolder and, frankly, take some more risks. Um, and that means uh, that they're going to have to, uh, I think, get more offensive minded uh, in, in their, uh, in their uh, cyber strategy, not just play defense. Um, and th that is risky because that means there's a possibility for a kind of a tit for tat escalation that could uh, spin out of control. And remember, the United States um, is more vulnerable than any other nation because we are the most uh, digitally connected uh, nation in the world. And beyond that, um, much of our critical infrastructure is owned by the private sector, which gives the government less uh, leverage. Uh, the interesting that I think happened, thing that happened in the wake of the uh, Chinese attack on uh, Microsoft servers and the Microsoft email system is that the Biden administration, uh, they did not impose sanctions on the Chinese, but they called them out. And what they did was they, they rallied uh, their allies and partners, uh, particularly the European Union and NATO for the first time, uh, to call out the Chinese for what they did. That's important because it suggests a kind of multilateral approach uh, consistent with you know, uh, Biden's, uh, you know, his, his more general approach toward uh, foreign policy. Uh, but um, getting our allies behind us is really the only way uh, that uh, that the United States is going to be effective against the Chinese. Dan, we're talking about a, a 21st century issue, but there's an old fashioned issue. And the, the withdrawal of the troops from Afghanistan is part of that because we need to have our military forces ready. Uh, I don't want to say in case something happens with Taiwan, but the, the president's alluded to those kinds of things, hasn't he? It, you know, it it is. It really is. Exactly that. I mean, it's broader than that. It, it, you know, successive administrations, including the previous administration, the Trump administration, have desperately wanted to get out of the quicksand of the Middle East and pivot toward Asia because everyone knows that our economic uh, interests and our national security interests lie there, uh, perhaps more than anywhere else, with China rising. I mean, China will uh, 
as you you guys know, will surpass the United States uh, as an economic as the uh, uh, premier economic power in the world in in, in ten years. Um, and so there is no time uh, to lose here. And um, it, 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 you know, look, the problem is is that the Middle East always kind of sucks you back in. You know, you've got the possibility of a terrorist attack uh, that could always happen, and you've got um, uh, Iran. Um, that uh, remains a a, uh, a real threat uh, to our national security. Uh, but um, at, at the Biden administration made the, the decision. This is something that Joe Biden, I think, um, has believed in for quite some time. That 20 years in Afghanistan was enough. It's the uh, we're about to have the 20th anniversary of the of, of September the S September 11th attacks, um, and that it was uh, it was it was time to do this. By the way. Uh, there are also domestic political considerations as well. Uh, this has not been a popular war. We've, you know, 2,500 American troops died there, 20,000 um, wounded, and tens and tens of billions um, of, of American treasure uh, that we've spent there. So uh, that was a consideration as well. Dan, I know another issue that you're closely been tracking has been the division that we're seeing within the Democratic Party over the past six months, the first six months of President Biden in the White House. We even heard it earlier this hour, Congressman DeFazio, he was basically saying that he's not happy with the bipartisan infrastructure bill that's, deal that so many of the Democrats are pushing at this point. I guess, what does President Biden need to do going forward in order to successfully deal with some of the division that we're seeing within the Democratic Party? Well, this was always going to be tough uh, for, for Joe Biden. Um, and I actually think he's succeeded uh, far better than most people would have expected um, uh, up until this point. Uh, it was always going to be very tricky to kind of keep this coalition together. I think he was smart uh, by coming out very quickly uh, with, that, with that very significant um, uh, COVID uh, relief package that had a lot of things uh, that, uh, that, that progressives in the Democratic Party party wanted, including the child tax credit. Um, and, and so that gave him um, a little bit of capital uh, moving forward. But it gets tougher and tougher uh, as, as he goes along. I, I think if they can, if they can pull off uh, this kind of uh, two-step uh, dance here and get the, uh, the, the sort of hard infrastructure bill passed, which I know is looking more and more tenuous, uh, then if he's going to be able to uh, have a much better chance of getting the $3.5 trillion um, infrastructure uh, a bill passed. And that one, if he does that, get that passed, uh, he will be a hero uh, to progressives. And I think he will do just fine with moderates. You know, that legislation, um, he, he will be the sort of the, the, the FDR of the modern era. Uh, and, and so, I, I, you know, but that's still, we, we, we just have to see what's going to happen. It's going to be tough. Um, so yes. far, so good. I noticed. I noticed, by the way, uh, that in in when he when he had the meeting with the Democratic Caucus on the in, on the hard infrastructure bill, he got three standing ovations um, in that uh, in that meeting, and that was not just moderates; it was progressives as, as well. Dan Clydman is the Yahoo News editor in chief. Thank you for joining us, Dan. All the best to you, and thank all of you for joining Shauna and myself. We hope you have a wonderful evening.